Hello everyone and thanks for making time to join us again for this second in our series of webinars with Stronglink uh, for Strongbox Data Solutions with Stronglink. The subject of this uh, webinar is, is managing and protecting your data. Uh, my name is Nick and I'm one of the directors at Global Distribution and let me just uh, introduce uh, Floyd, the CEO of uh, Strongbox Data Solutions. Uh, Floyd has been involved in uh, large-scale data solutions, content management across many verticals for 20 plus years. Uh, how long have you, and so maybe over to you, uh, Floyd, just to say a few words about Strongbox uh, before we sort of carry on with the presentation for today. Sure, Strongbox Data Solutions has a, a legacy in managing large archives from our previous uh, legacy product strong box uh, which was a tape platform to the current one that we'll be talking about today which is strong link brilliant and just to give people sort of a little flavor of, of kind of how large you guys go in terms of sort of capacities and things like that just to give people a flavor of you know you know what are the kind of larger installs you have out there just give you know give the customers an idea of that yeah, sure. We range, most of our customers range from a minimum of around 200 uh, terabytes up to hundreds of petabytes. Mm -hmm. uh, and literally, the, the scale out capabilities of our systems are really designed for that reality. Perfect. Okay. So, well, last week we showed you, uh, showed uh, everyone how Stronglink can be used to uh, virtualize, if you will, multiple separate. Uh, data silos, uh, bring them all together in a global namespace, whether they be uh, NFS or SMB or S3, uh, and the Stronglink engine would kind of extract the metadata. Uh, and this session is really about putting that metadata to some use, uh, being able to uh, sort of protect volumes and manage them and, and, and leverage that metadata power to do that. So without too much further ado, uh, Floyd, I'll hand over to you to okay. uh, take over. Okay, thanks, Nick. Let me just switch here. So yeah, as Nick said, um, last week we talked about the common problem that we see, especially in larger data environments where there is no one type of storage that will handle all of the use cases. Um, this means, for example, you may have multiple generations of, of storage or uh, your data gets trapped in one type of storage and I say trapped, not because it's physically locked there, but because moving it to lower cost storage or other types of storage or cloud, these become difficult to do uh, uh, because you disrupt access to your users uh, from those. Um, what, what we do with Stronglink is create an abstraction layer, um, which I covered more in, in the first part. Uh, but it's a metadata-driven abstraction layer, so abstraction layer, so that a user is connected to their data, and that that frees up storage administrators from move, to move that data and protect it in, in other ways uh, without disrupting the users. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about today on on ways that that we accomplish that. I mentioned, and it's important to remind you that we do this based on the data itself. It's the data and it's metadata that informs us and informs the uh, storage administrator on where that data should be placed. So extracting the file system metadata, so you know how old the files are. Um, we're extracted metadata from the headers of certain file types, but also the ability to create custom metadata. And these could be tags with a project ID, a retention date, um, virtually anything. And to do this in a way that is easy for the average user to do. Um, all of these metadata get aggregated into the Stronglink metadata repository. And that really provides the intelligence then to, to move that data and to be able to manage that data across all of your different stores. So aggregate the metadata which then feeds into our engines for managing and understanding what those data are, being able to use that understanding to trigger data movement um, and to query and find uh, files, but also to automate workflow, some of which I'll talk more about in our next session. Um, we connect to storage both in and out of the data path so that you can manage your, your high IOPS, you know, high performance direct uh, without going through any any uh, intermediary layer, 
but we also present this in a global namespace across multiple protocols so that you can create controlled access to that. So regardless of whether that storage um, handles uh, the different, different types, different data types, um, or different protocols, um, you can access a, a, an S3 only object store via SMB or NFS, et cetera. And this is really where we start getting into how data can be, be uh, easier or, or better protected. Um, because it's important to note that unlike HSMs or other systems, this is really any to any data movement. Why is that important? Um, as the data comes in, and it may come in directly again from a, an app, uh, directly into a tier zero or you know higher performance storage, or it may uh, it may come uh, to tier one through a global namespace. Whichever way that that data arrives, um, the the data is going to land somewhere. Inevitably, that fo those files will not live in that storage throughout their life cycle. The data always outlasts the storage it lives on. Um, so what, what Stronglink can then do is, um, first of all, analyzing what that data is so that the system knows how old it is, how frequently it's accessed, if there's other metadata that needs to be associated with that, but then by policy determining where that data can go. And maybe it goes to an object store, or if you've got a tape library, maybe it goes to, to tape, or it goes to other stores. Um, and again, uh, in, in most, you know, especially in very, uh, you know, crit data critical, you'll want three copies. So that, that a, a copy could be on tape, it could go to cloud, um, it could go to a vault um, to protect against ransomware. So strong link automation, um, by policy, again, driven by the metadata, can determine which of these stores any particular data type or any particular class of file should live. So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And as I mentioned with the any to any, it can go directly from your tier zero to tape or tier zero to cloud or create other copies elsewhere. So there's no, no stubs, no sim links, no need to alter your file systems or put agents on the storage itself. It's where the data uh, needs to live today based on your workflows, based on the retention policies for those files. And then over time, as, as the files age or as use cases change or requirements change, you're able to directly access them, first of all, because of the metadata, uh, being able to know where they are and be able to manage that. Let me show you how that looks in Stronglink, in the application itself. So what you're seeing on the screen now on the left-hand side is the Stronglink web application. This is, uh, uh, doesn't require any client software to be installed. Uh, if you've got Active Directory credentials or other credentials, um, we will map your permissions to that. And as a user logs in, they will see whatever they're entitled to see in a global namespace. This is a demo system running on a VM environment in our lab in Oregon. I'm in California. On the right, you'll see an SMB share. Um, this is just a simple uh, uh, NAS mount uh, to the global namespace from my Mac. And you'll see I've got three, or three different uh, namespaces that I've mounted here. All of these are subsets of the, of the actual um, global namespace and all of the data. And as a user, if I'm on the right, I can access those files, I can work on them, and I may or may not even know that Stronglink is in the mix. But let's go back and look at the, that same file within Stronglink. If I click on this button here, this indicator here, it shows the store data. Um, which means which, which actual physical devices that file lives on. And it lives on them by policy. Um, and uh, if I click full detail here, you'll see more, where we've got checksums, which we will automatically compute when we ingest those files. And I'll come to that in a minute. We've got our metadata, and we've got some rich metadata here. But you can see we've got, we've got the, the, the different stores that this lives on. So by policy, 
as data arrives in your wherever it comes in, your tier zero or tier one, Stronglink will monitor that and by policy can then make copies. Um, if I show you an example, even within our job scheduler, where um, it, we want to do a copy policy that looks at a particular namespace or maybe is triggered by a query, a particular query that might look for certain attributes. And then by policy, you could say, move it, move it to Amazon or move it to a Spectra Black Pearl or directly to uh, LTFS or to a Scality Ring or to whichever storage you may wish. And in fact, you can do these operations all at once. So by setting that policy, whether it's to cloud or to tape or to uh, a, a tier two or tier three storage, then the system will automatically move that data and create your policies. You may have a three, a minimum of three copy policy for certain types of critical data, whereas scratch data or other things, you may only need to keep one copy because uh, you don't care. Um, it, can, it can be lost um, if need be. And you've got that choice uh, uh, with the granularity of the system to be able to find the data based on, on whatever criteria you want. Let me show you an example here where uh, this down the lower left is, is my query builder. And so here I've built a query that is based on a project ID and a retention date. Um, so maybe I want to look at that project ID and look at everything that you know, is less than a, a particular retention date. But maybe I also want to take that file action on, on files that, uh, where the file system, the access time, um, is less than a certain amount. So as a user uh, or as an administrator, I can say that I want to find all files from this project with this retention date that haven't been accessed in greater than 30 days. I can build that query, save that query, use that query to, to, to schedule the job, as I mentioned, but also use that query to run a report, either you know, for a namespace report or a query report. So you can audit how many files are there, where they live, which stores do they live, and then by policy determine how they migrate across the different stores over the life cycle of that data. Typically, we will see that in tier one storage, 70 or 80% of the files that are in there have not been copied anywhere else other than through a backup application. More importantly, that, uh, that 70 or 80% uh, are, are largely, have not been used very frequently. And in fact, you know, the percentage of about 80% is, is let, um, files that have not been accessed in 45 days. So that what that means is, and if they haven't been accessed in 45 days, it's highly unlikely based on most studies that we've seen, it's highly unlikely that they will ever be accessed this, it, until they're needed, right? Which means that you know, disconnecting them from the users for protection purposes or for tiering purposes means that often they'll go into a backup blob um, or they'll be sitting on your most expensive storage tier. So with strong link automation, then you'll not only know what that file is, but then you can decide the policy to keep your tier one storage um, only containing those active files, but without disconnecting the users. So we've moved the files downstream by policy. We enable persistent access to those files as well. Uh, one other thing to note here is that Stronglink also has the capability of providing a data provenance. This is a new feature that we're just releasing, which means that you can see within the system a history of that file as it's moved from source storage to, to primary to secondary to other copies. You'll see when it moved, who moved it, and as well, even users accessing the system, we do have a, a user audit log. So you'll be able to see if, you know, for forensic analysis or other things, be able to go back and track who touched that file and, you know, when did they touch it? Again, it's part of the idea is that from a global perspective, without being tied into any particular vendor storage solution, an administrator can manage how many copies there are, when they move, who's touched them, 
um, with a history of where they've been for data provenance, as well as just for the practical reality of managing those files over time. So that's one site. Um, the, the, a second site as well is, is able to uh, be done in, in using our, our global data protection. We call this a galaxy, which means multiple strong link constellations that can be tied together for protection purposes. In this in, um, use case, for example, we may have a primary data center site um, with a variety of different storage types. And you may have a DR site or off-site location. A second strong link instance here, and again, this could be a single node. If this is a non-production site, this does not have to be the same configuration as your primary. This could be a single node that listens to the primary site and as changes occur in here in metadata, instantly the second strong link uh, system is aware of those changes and the entire metadata database here is kept current with the primary. Secondarily, you can determine if you want to copy those files to your second site and so that you've got file access, either all the files or maybe only a critical portion of the files so that you create a DR site where a subset of your files or the entire data uh, set. And the stores here can be different, different store types. It can be anything, an object store or tape or both or whatever, whatever you want. Um, and that's, again, the key. You know, we don't, we don't mandate what, what, type of, uh, what type of storage solution you, you need. Um, and then again, uh, you know, you've always got that option of pushing it, you know, automatically to cloud. Um, again, it doesn't have to be monolithic. It can be parts of that data. And then, of course, with, our, with tape capabilities, you know, we can uh, push those tapes out, a second copy on a tape that can go on a shelf or be pushed off site. It's important to remember as well, though, that Stronglink does not charge by capacity. Oftentimes, we'll see solutions that say, okay, we'll manage your data, but you know, the more data you have, the more it's gonna cost you. We, are, we don't believe in that. We think that you've already paid a capacity charge for your storage, that's inevitable. So you shouldn't have to pay by capacity to manage that data. So whether you're managing single copies, multiple copies, multiple sites, you pay for the performance uh, of the system itself. And, and this is also important to note. You know, it's not only in, in the data itself and the policies to protect and move that data, but also even the architecture of our system. Stronglink is software, as I covered in, in the first one, and can install on a VM, as I've done in my example, or uh, in my, my test system, or it can be installed on bare metal. Um, it's an ISO, it includes everything in it. But what's key about this is this is not a traditional Linux cluster where you've got a head node and then you've got worker nodes beside that. Each of these nodes, the software is the same on all of them. And they communicate with each other with an internal network so that all metadata is sharded across all available nodes. And any node can, uh, can uh, have a hardware failure or other interruption and the system has no metadata loss, and as well, it does not interrupt action. Um, so again, you know, resilience within the system to be able to uh, manage that, but then also resilience within the, the actual hardware and software configuration. Again, not installing agents, not, manage, not doing anything other than connecting to that with a store-side network that lets you move data at line rate. Um, from store to store or to tape um, as you need. Clients will access through the front side network uh, and they will see the entire global namespace or parts of it as you need. So again, Stronglink is really designed as a tool set that enables you to manage your data um, using commodity parts um, uh, at, the, at the system level sized to your need so that you're not overbuying, you only buy what you need, 
Um, not limited by capacity in any way because we can scale up. There's really no limit to the volume of data that we can manage. Um, but also then enables you to conform this to your workflows, your storage choices, your, your policies for the different types of data, and to ensure that you can then automate this, this process behind the scenes so that your storage administrators do not have to spend their entire lives trying to figure out where their data is, is it protected, and where and, and how to service better the, their, their internal clients. So there's a, a summary. Um, we can open it up for questions, Nick. Hi there, thanks very much for that, Floyd. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, as Floyd said, we're going to open it up for some questions now. So everyone, you should see uh, a text box at the bottom of your screen, and you can send us in some questions. I've got a couple of points that I'd like to pick up on with you on Floyd, actually. Um, uh, you're mentioning that the system obviously can run bare metal or as a VM. There's a lot of large sort of media companies or large companies in general that are, are looking at a cloud-first sort of strategy. Um, so ha can uh, can uh, strong link can that be installed in the cloud or uh, uh, you know do you have clients doing that at the moment? Sure. Uh, most clients are not installing in the cloud, although we do have one that has a use case where they've already had a lot of data in the cloud, and rather than pulling that data down to uh, uh, to do you know file analysis or other things. We can actually install an instance of, of StrongLink in the cloud where we can harvest the metadata directly in the cloud. And then all only thing that we're piping uh, downstream is the metadata. Uh, but to answer the first part of that question, we, we in fact, we, we install StrongLink in the cloud all the time. We use it for you know, extensive testing environments yeah. up there where we can stand up EC2 instances, <laughs> for example. So it does work. The majority of our customers, and it's mainly just because of the performance, will opt for an on-prem bare metal for most sure. of their primary workflow. Right. Okay. And of course, I guess just because you're you're uh, accessing the metadata, you've got no kind of egress cost. So if someone did have a large data set in the cloud, if you're just harvesting that metadata, there's not going to be any kind of large egress cost to bring that down. No. Yeah. No. Exactly. Because. Because your, your, your view into the StrongLink database, as I showed, you know, when you access through the web UI, um, that, that view is wherever you are, yeah. right? So you can, you, you're searching metadata, and that mm -hmm. metadata is already in our database. So yeah. you can search, you can see whatever annotation has already been placed on it and make decisions only on those particular files you need without having to pull a bunch of data out, out of uh, out of the cloud first yeah. so uh, just wanted to pick up on the licensing model because we we went through that in the first webinar but i know you touched on it in your presentation this time round but it just if you could explain to the viewers uh, how the licensing model works you know it, i think this is especially relevant to this uh, session on protect and manage because depending on your capacity you need to manage and the metadata you're extracting, presumably you may even be able to get away with kind of one server and that could manage, sure. you know, hundreds of terabytes or petabytes at a very predictable cost. Yeah. The volume of data is, is almost irrelevant to the number of nodes you have because we're, the only thing that is contained, we don't store any customer data in, the, in our strong link nodes. It's just the metadata. Now, if you've got, you know, many, many billions of objects, you'll need more metadata space that might require more nodes. But in general, what all you need is, uh, is to dis determine what your IO is, because there's the physics of how many network cards and what your performance is, and whether your objects are gonna be more than could be contained. We don't store any data on those servers. It's just metadata. All we're doing is managing the movement of that data. So start with a single node, grow when you need, with the confidence that only what you're doing is buying performance, similar to like a, a, a network switch, where you know Cisco doesn't ask how much data you pipe through, their, the, sure. through the network, they just say this is the performance you get. 
And that, and we, we, we figured that was the best model to adopt yeah. here as well. Okay. Actually, that seems to have sped. There are questions come, there's a question come in on, on performance. I'm just looking here. So there, someone's asking how many, how many tape drives would a single node or node uh, support in a, Sure. Some of that is dependent upon the network and what you know what drive type it is, whether it's an older LTO or newer. Uh, but I mean, we've got tests where a single node will be pushing six tape drives at line rate, right, right. Uh, and, and, and very fast. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we can scale out. I mean, we've got an environment where we've got 40 drives mapped mm -hmm. to a, a strong link constellation that is pushing extremely fast I.O. And the, and that's but there's another question on it about, about disk cache required per per LTO drive, um, and I think actually I think I know the answer. You you guys obviously don't use any disk cache, so maybe it might be worth highlighting the you know sure. how, how this works. Yeah, that's important to note as well. Um, I touched on it very briefly in the presentation, but to clarify, you know, a lot of times if you're moving from a tier zero or a tier one storage to an archive, um, you know, tape, for example, you've got to go through a mezzanine or you've got to go through some sort of a disk, disk cache. That adds cost. And, and this is the importance of how our architecture is for an any to any, is that we can, I mean, we'll have a very small disk cache with, with tape, like 100 terabytes in a, in a, you know, even to manage a 100 petabyte environment. But that's just for tape handling. But the reality is, is that when a user is pulling tape from, or when a data moves from primary to tape or to anywhere else, it can go direct because the return path doesn't need to be the same. Yeah. Unlike an HSM where you have to rehydrate back through the same path, mm -hmm. we can go from primary to tape, tape back to somewhere else. Um, you can move data from any to any throughout the yeah. system as you need. Yeah. And that and that's because you're not using any file stubbing or, or sim links. That's that's Correct. the advantage. Of that. and, and especially over time, stubs mm -hmm. and sim links, they, they break. Yeah. You know, data is gonna outlast the storage. And if you now have a chain of sim links, you have to reconcile that. Um, it's it's not a solid strategy for a very long term data archive. And that's actually it's a very good point. I you mentioned that sort of data outlives the storage. So, you know, I know you guys have this sort of concept of evergreen, or this, this concept of evergreen storage that effectively, you know, the, the strong link, you know, masks all the sort of, the, the, you know, the abstracts or masks everything going on beneath it in, in a way. And you can quite easily migrate from, you know, maybe you've got NetApp or Isilon, you can migrate sure. from those to Cumulo or whatever. And, you know, the applications or the users are, are you know, they're not aware of that. That's a transparent move. Yeah, and I didn't. Uh, we didn't have time to highlight it in the demonstration, but we have a, a capability that we call a smart pool, a strong link smart pool. And what that is is where we can aggregate multiple different, otherwise incompatible storage types into a logical group, which load balances across them. You'll see this a lot of times in research environments where they will have little pockets of NAS uh, uh, systems around, or sometimes even in enterprise where you've got different pockets. But more importantly, it, when you're facing the need for a data migration, right? Um, yeah. and, that, uh, and that's a, that's a disruptive event. You have to you know, stand up a whole new system and then cut people over, do all of this with minimum of disruption. But with StrongLink, you're able to then do that transparently because that smart pool can aggregate your future storage, what will be the next one, with the previous storage, and then in an orderly way, you can transition. So again, the idea is a tool set that limits the disruption to the users and maximizes the control that the, uh, that the uh, storage administrator can have over, over those policies. Perfect. Okay. Well, I think we're, we're coming towards the end of our time uh, now. So I think what I'll just do is uh, go to quickly, let's grab the slide just to show, talk a little bit about what's coming up um, next week on the uh, 16th of uh, June. That session is titled Workflow Magic. Uh, it's about getting the most out of the data that you have. Uh, and we'll be exploring how StrongLink's powerful set of management tools uh, will combine with their policy automation to really drive efficiency, uh, which will help uh, you know help get the most out of your data, 
remove uh, human error or reduce human error uh, in your system. And uh, also, I think, uh, Floyd, you're going to talk a little bit more about audit trails uh, for both data and users, uh, which is a new feature that you guys are adding soon. Yep. Um, so uh, just to remind everyone, that's the 16th of June. That's uh, next week. Um, so uh, just quickly to say uh, a very big thank you to Floyd Christofferson, uh, CEO of Strongbox Data Solution. You can reach Floyd at fc at strongboxdata.com. Uh, of course, any information on Stronglink is on their website, strongboxdata.com. I've been Nick Warburton, Director at Global Distribution. You can reach me at nickw at globaldistribution.com. And of course, information uh, on our website, globaldistribution.com. So um, again, thanks very much for joining us, our partners across Europe uh, and the US. Uh, so I'll just hand over to Sir Floyd to say thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, looking forward to uh, the next session on the 16th. Thank you, Nick. And thank you, everybody, for your time today. Perfect. OK, great. Thanks, Floyd. Bye. See you. Bye-bye.